I would like to start this off with a quote from Santiago Ramon y Calle. Um, he says, to know the brain is equivalent to ascertaining the material course of thought and will, to discovering the intimate history of life in its perpetual duel against the forces of nature. What I think it's important to mention when we talk about the nervous system is, it's in the context of life. It's in the context of survival. It was made in that sense. So to be able to compare it with artificial neural networks, we may be able to understand what cognition truly is. So I'm first gonna talk about what the nervous system is. The nervous system coordinates and controls actions through sensory information that, 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 that they would get. Um, we're gonna talk about afferent neurons later to talk about this. The neuron is a type of cell that transmits this information and processes it. The nervous system is broken up into two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is where higher order thinking would occur with the peripheral nervous system being pretty much everywhere else in your body. So you might, you might imagine would be like interact with your muscles. So the anatomy of a nerve cell, and what's important for us is the dendrite is where information comes into the nerve cell and it goes through the axon to the axon terminus, which releases that information. This is, if you've heard the term neurotransmitters, the dendrite receives them, the axon terminus releases them. And the signal inside of the nerve cell that, um, is called the action potential. It's essentially electrical signal that functions differently than you might imagine tr traditional electrical signal does. Um, and it rapidly transmits this information. And these, this signal is an all or nothing signal. It's either on or off. So if you might imagine like a computer, you've heard of ones and zeros, this is how this information is represented. And what's important to note is, since it's on or off, how, does, how do you determine like how strong a response is? That's determined through synaptic plasticity, which we'll, which we'll discuss later, but also the frequency of it. So you might imagine like each time it's going off like at a millisecond, um, each time. And computers try to replicate this process uh, through artificial neural networks. And what's interesting is th these artificial neural networks were based off our understanding in the 40s. So they aren't uh, necessarily that accurate, but they still have a lot of this computational um, benefits from them. So, as we talked about, this is how the nerve cell um, processes information. But how does this processing of information turn out to anything? That is through the nerve cell wiring. I talked about earlier, there's sensory neurons. These afferent neurons are essentially what you might imagine is like a pain receptor. These interneurons transmit the information and where some of this processing might occur. The efferent neurons are where a action would take place. If you want to imagine a reflex arc, this is just a theoretical, I'm not going to talk about like an, like an actual one, that'll take too long. If you were to touch a hot stove, it would, your finger, you'd want to pull it back. This NASA receptor, or the pain receptor, so the sensory neuron, would essentially signal to your body that you want to pull it back. The interneurons would then communicate that, although there might be only one or two because it's a reflex arc, it's very simple, um, to your spinal cord. And your spinal cord would essentially um, activate your effector neurons, or these efferent neurons, that will pull it back and generate the response. What's important to note with these action potentials are, and these signals, they can either inhibit or cause a, um, a muscle to contract or not contract. And what's important is this inhibiting will come into play later. So, as I talked about, I've been dancing around this, the synapse is the place where this, tr this transformation of information goes from one neuron to another. I talked about the action potentials, the intracellular communication. This is the extracellular communication. It's a gap between the axon terminus and the dendrite. Um, this, this is where the signal takes place. This is where the neurotransmitters are released from the axon terminus, and then they go into the, neuro, um, they go into the dendrites. And then these receptors pick up the signals, and then these, in the right circumstance, if, they're strong, if it's a strong enough signal, and it's between the right part, because dendrites, they can connect up to 10,000 different cells in the brain. So if there's enough, a strong enough signal from well, these different parts of the dendrites, this is kind of like a tree, in that regard, it will cause the action potential. So the learning occurs in the synaptic plasticity. Uh, Santiago Ramon um, thought, and many other people thought in the past, that it was in the wiring is where, the, where we learn. But the synaptic plasticity and the synapse is the only, one of the few parts in our, of our brain that will keep learning and adapting throughout all of life. And this can result in this types and strength of neurotransmitters being altered. 
Um, this is where the learning occurs. If we're going back to this example about the reflex arc, if you were to touch this hot plate and you're, it, it were to hurt a lot, um, your brain isn't actually involved with the movement, but it gets the signal after. And if, after it receives that signal, and you, you look at your finger and it's burned, you're, you're going to be a lot more sensitized to this reaction. You're going to react more rapidly next time. But if you look at your finger again, and your finger is fine, then you might not pull it back as quickly. That's sensitization, and that's habituation. So now to compare to artificial neural networks. In the 1940s, um, Alan Turing, which was one of the fathers of computing, actually had a paper. Um, he, he had spoke about artificial neural networks, but this information was lost. Um, it, this didn't actually come up for another like 10 or 20 years after, where artificial neural networks were trying to follow what's called the connectionist approach to AI. It's trying to replicate our biological systems to create um, cognition and processing to solve problems. And, but they're not trying to replicate it one for one. It's just through these processes that we can try to understand cognition and use it to solve problems. Artificial neural networks, also known as deep learning, um, occurs through the alteration of these synapse connections, as I was, like I was talking about earlier. The input layers are similar to the afferent ones. They receive the signals. And then the interneurons are where the processing occurs. And the output layers are similar to the efferent neurons. These input neurons, um, what's different about them between, and uh, biological neurons are, they'll generally receive a number from zero to one. And this is because, just in terms of the math, when you talk about gradient descent, it's going to be, it, it's a lot more helpful for it to be in terms of this number. And, um, and what, what I think is important to notice, um, for example, um, if deep learning is used a lot in vision. If you were to imagine, if you were to um, imagine you're looking at a number, right? And this number is, uh, you're looking at the pixels of this, um, like, like this number. And you're looking, you're basically breaking it apart into each pixels. You might imagine like a ton of these input layers, a ton of these input neurons. And then there would be a number to represent like how shaded it would be. And then from there, you could start to look at the shapes of the number. You might be able to get like, like if it's a three, you might be able to like notice one of the curves. And as it goes on until it reaches the output layer, it's going to be more and more abstract. This is, where, this is why, like, for example, the brain, um, it's further away from a lot of the actions. If you have a peripheral nervous system, by the time it's in the brain, you're thinking a lot about at higher levels of learning. Um, if you, the spinal cord, um, which connects to the brain, um, has a, looks at information in this less abstract level. So people put um, optimization equations, like the ones you may see in calculus, to essentially have machine, uh, machine learning algorithms use these to create results. So as I talked about earlier, synaptic plasticity plays into how we learn. Backpropagation is, the, is how computers learn from their mistakes. In the beginning, when you have an artificial uh, neural network, these, um, these connections, these synapses, they, they have weights. And these weights are completely randomized. Um, if you might imagine, this um, connection might be extremely strong because if this input layer, if, if we're going back to the number example, is very high, it's very likely that, that it might be this shape. And because of that, it's, it's a more important connection. It would, and how the computer learns that that's a more important connection is with backpropagation. And with backpropagation, it calculates it based off of a loss function and adjusts the synaptic values with an algorithm. And this loss, this loss function is how far off the error or the prediction was. And with gradient descent is a common example of an algorithm for backpropagation. So um, thank you for listening to my talk. <laughs>